Monica Medina Muro, and I am the junior art historian for Northern California Arts Incorporated. And I'm here with Tom Thompson in his home to interview him about his connection with NCA. I'm Tom Thompson, a longtime member of NCA. That acronym stands for Northern California Arts, and it was incorporated. You know, it was an interesting story how NCA became. And back in the 1930s, there were half a dozen Sacramento area painters, all men, who got together periodically and would go out plein air painting. And the ringleader of those guys was a man named Harold Ward. Harold was um, born in Queens, I think it was, in Brooklyn, New York. In, um, I think he was born in 1889 in June of that year, and he grew up, he studied at Pratt Institution, and then that was the tag end of the French Impressionist period, so he went to Paris, and he studied with some of those old guys that did Impressionist work, and finally came back to America, and wound up in California. He taught at uh, the high school up in Calusa, California, and he was there for years and years, taught art. And finally, he got the call from um, Sacramento Junior College out by Land Park, now known as City College, and his job was to found the art department. And that was, I think, in about 1930 or 28, 29, somewhere back in there. And so that was his department from the beginning. And he continued to teach there until 1939 or thereabouts and when he finished teaching he felt the need to do his own painting and then to teach other people how to paint because that's what he'd been doing and so he started a little class of some students who came out of his city college class and I think he limited the classes to 12 and they would plain air paint, and then they would go paint in the garage of somebody else. And I heard about him in the 50s when he was doing that. And so I got a hold of Harold Ward on the phone, and I said, would you be interested in taking on another class here in Sacramento? And he said, well, let's talk about it. Where, where shall we meet for coffee? So we met, and we talked about it. We said, how about... We start in my garage. We've got a big garage and it's clean, it's not junky. And then we're in the process of building a studio on our property where we can have the class. So he came over, we met, and we found a day that worked best. So Tuesdays from 1 to 4, he would come to our property and finally 12 of us gathered and we would learn from Harold Ward. Harold's middle name was Morris, Harold Morris Ward. And that uh, name came from a relative. He was related to Samuel F. B. Morris, the man who invented the Morris Code. And Samuel Morris was also an excellent fine art painter. And one of his most famous extremely large paintings is of one of the salons in the Louvre in Paris. And he painted the interior and every little painting that was hanging on the walls at that time. So it's uh, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Harold Ward then took on the same kind of a skill that the uncle had. So time progressed and back to uh, the 1930s. This half a dozen men who used to get together and uh, paint plain air or paint at somebody's backyard or whatever. Um, he said, we ought to put together an organization. There had been a previous organization in Sacramento that started, and it was called Kingsley. And Kingsley was um, made up of artists who uh, were enjoying the more newly found impressionistic and abstract art forms. And so they, their interest was not in making um, a stone jug look like a stone jug or making a red barn look like a red barn. And so 
they, the men decided we should start an organization that is specifically for realist painters and see what we can do. And so in 1939, these guys put together the, the thing that we now call Northern California Arts Incorporated. And their uh, edict was, you must be a realist painter. You know, we already have Kingsley. And as it turned out, Kingsley was made more um, of uh, the patrons of the arts than it was of the artists. There were a few artists in the uh, membership, but more interested in having the patrons so they could support artists to do their paintings. And as I recall, they held their meetings at the Crocker Art Museum down in the basement. So the NCA group was designed specifically to be the other side of the fence, the realist painters who did portraits and landscapes and seascapes and great old trees that you could recognize as a tree. And that was the beginning of NCA. When they had their first meetings, they met at the, the, uh, the park downtown, um, McKinley Park, and McKinley Park had a tiny little uh, worker's room and a little gathering place there by the Rose Garden. The, the building still sits there. And so it was during those years that I began to study with Harold Ward. And one of Harold's first things to tell me was, you must join NCA. And he said, and when you do, you may not just join, you have to be active in NCA. You have to volunteer and you have to take on board positions as they become available. And you need to learn the inner runnings of an art organization and especially how they run their shows. So. I went and I volunteered and the only open position was for editor of the monthly newsletter. So I did that for my first year or so. And then up came board time again and I got moved up to become the exhibition chairman. And that means that I was responsible to put together all the exhibits that NCA did in town at that time. And so um, uh, one of my first ones was at the State Fair, and we met out there to receive art in from uh, the, the patrons who wanted to enter this juried show. And uh, among them, I met some of the great artists of those eras. There was a, a little guy whose name was Lee Cavalgen, and he was a professor at Sac State. He taught botany and biology, but his passion was art. And he was a... Um, um, what would you call him, a, a ceramic sculptor, and he also did hand-hooked rugs, and he did copper enameling, and when I saw his work, I said, I want to learn to do copper enameling. Would you come over to our studio at my house and teach me how to do that? And so, as he and I stood there talking, uh, the man with the camera walked over, and he said, I'm the man from the Sacramento Bee, and I am looking to take a picture to, for tomorrow's paper to promote the art show. Uh, could I take a photograph of you two guys? And so I said, well, I'm fine to do that. What about you, Lee? And he said, yeah, I'm okay. So we posed holding one of Lee's um, uh, pieces of art. And the next day our picture was on the front page of the uh, art section. And that was my first meeting with uh, one of the more famous artists in the Sacramento area. He and I became great friends. That was in about 1954. And um, he was the best man at my wedding when my wife and I were married. And uh, he and I talk on the phone every night at 9 o'clock to be sure we're still okay now that we're senior citizens. So that's how friendships start and that's how they continue. And so time passes on, and uh, I was then, at the next uh, board change, elected to be the vice president of NCA. And uh, I attended all the board meetings and did the things that I was asked to do. And eventually, in about 1960, I was uh, elected president of NCA. 
And in that very same year, I married my wife, and um, within one year, almost to the day, our first of three children was born, and so my life was busier. I was a professional musician, I played church organ, and then I played in supper clubs, and I taught organ music, and it became necessary for me to step away from NCA for a bit so that I could um, support my family. Well, time passed, and I couldn't resist getting back to NCA, and so I rejoined in, um, I can't remember the exact year, but it was in more recent years, and immediately they asked me, would you please take on the role of president of NCA? Nobody else wants to do it because it takes so much time. So I said, okay, you got me again. And so for two times, I was the president of NCA. Uh, back to the years with Harold Ward, um, I studied with him for eight years. And during the, those years, you become not just teacher-student, but you become friends. And in the, in the fall, for example, uh, Harold would uh, come over and get me and we would pack our lunch and we would put our easels in the car and head up to the high mountains in the Sierras, a place called Cisco Grove where they had the most beautiful fall colors up in that part of the Sierras. And we would sit in the grove and plain air paint all day long and talk art. And I have some of the paintings that I did back then with Harold. Harold's wife was uh, a crocker, and uh, the family that built the railroads and uh, that donated their home that became the Crocker Museum, Art Museum. And so once in a while, Harold and his wife, Maybell, would invite me to dinner at their house. And after dinner, Harold would paint, and his wife, Maybell, played the piano. And since I was a pianist and piano teacher, she would ask me, Let's, why don't we do some duets, some forehand things? And so I said, sounds like fun. So she and I would work on great old piano works while Harold painted. And those were precious, precious, wonderful times all around NCA. Well, here we are now, and I'm coming up to my 90th Christmas and working on my Christmas card. When I was in high school, I started doing my own Christmas cards. Back then it was linoleum block print, and I graduated up to, um, to um, silk screen, and then finally I learned how to take my paintings and convert them to cards, and I still do that every year. And I have only about 50 friends that are still around that get my cards, and I've been to their homes, and. Some of them have dedicated walls to the Tom Thompson Christmas card collection. It's almost embarrassing, but it's also fun that they care. So I'm, I'm working on my Christmas card now for this year, which is 2021. So that, that's kind of the story. Um, NCA, um, after they met in the uh, little garden shed, in McKinley Park, um, farther down the block and across the street, they built the Ivagard Shepherd Garden and Art Center. And so when it was completed, we moved our NCA meetings into that building. And when uh, we were in that building is when I was first elected to president of NCA. And so, um, it seemed like we needed a better place to meet, a bigger place, a place where we could have shows also. And so my eldest two sons were in high school. We lived in Carmichael then, where I live now, and they announced that the old La Sierra High School was going to be closed down and they were going to absorb the students into El Camino High School and to Mira Loma High School and that the 42-acre property on which the high school sat would be uh, sold for condominiums or apartments or whatever they needed uh, land for, residential. And so 
we got together a group of citizens activists here in Carmichael who cared about our city and there is no auditorium in Carmichael, never has been. So we thought, you know, we ought to find a way to convert that high school setting into a community cultural center and turn one of the gymnasiums into an auditorium. So we could have school baccalaureates there and we could have a concert series. I even got my friend Michael Newman, the conductor of the Sacramento Youth Symphony, to come look and see if they could move the Youth Symphony to, if we got the, the place, into that facility, uh, perform in the auditorium. They had the big weight room where they could store the instruments. It was ideal. And so we set about with our committee meeting each week on a Monday night, and for two years we put together a plan, and we looked at other cities that had done similar things with schools that were closed down, turned them into community centers. And once we had the package all together, I uh, got on the uh, agenda for the uh, County Board of Supervisors, and I presented our plan to the Board of Supervisors and said, I recommend that Sacramento County purchase the land and convert it into a community cultural center and one of the questions came up but who, who would manage that and I said there's two options today in the universities there is a major that you can have that is called presentation and it teaches people how to develop and present uh, community cultural centers and how to manage them and I said the other option is you already have a full group of people in the Sacramento County Parks and Recreations District, it could become a part of that. And that is what they chose to do. So the county bought the La Sierra Community Center because of our efforts, and the very first tenant to sign in was the Northern California Fine Arts Center, and their first tenant was NCA, Northern California Arts. And now NCA has its home, it has several organizations that meet there, the Watercolor Society, the General uh, Oil Painters, the Photographers, and the, uh, the people who do textile art. And they have three galleries in the facility, and those three galleries are constantly filled with wonderful contemporary art by local people. The only thing that has kind of changed over the years is no longer is it specifically uh, people who paint realist or who do realist photography and so forth. It's now open to exploration and finding new ways to present great art forms. And that in kind of a long sentence is the history of Northern California artists. and. My wonderful director, Monica, has asked me to talk a little bit about my own life because it fits in with those things. Um, I, I've had two major careers in my life and an avocation. And um, I do paint. I paint regularly. I have had paintings in shows. I've won prizes for some of my things. And so I'm accepted as a, a reasonably good painter. And Monica may even take her camera around my house and see some of my paintings before we go home. And, but um, the, the, the early career that I had was in music, and I always wanted to do music. And art and music play hand in hand. When I was a small boy, probably eight years old, I had this passion to learn to play the piano. And I had never even seen a piano. And I remember, as if it was last week, my parents took me to some friend's house uh, where they had uh, a piano. And my father asked uh, the dad, who plays? And he said, well, I'm learning. And he said, I'll show you what I'm working on. So he, the dad sat down and he played a little tune called Bobby Shafto. And I asked him when he finished, would you care if I'd play the piano? Could I touch it? And he said, well, just don't hammer on it. Just play it gently. And as my parents describe it, I sat down and was able to pick out Bobby Shafto just the same way as the dad had played it. 
And the dad said, I thought she told me he had never had any piano lessons. And they said, this is the first time he's ever been at one of these things, as far as we know. And that was my early drive to want to learn to play a keyboard instrument. We lived in the town of Modesto, California. It's middle California. It's a, um, a town that's mostly um, products growing, uh, peaches and apricots, and the Gallo Winery is located there, and it's that kind of a town. But right across the street from where we lived was a little Methodist church. And I would sit out on the curb in front of my house on Sunday morning, and I could hear music coming from that building, and I could hear people singing, and I wanted to know what was going on over there because I could hear a musical instrument that I couldn't identify. And so one day I asked my mother, could I go to that church and see what they're doing? And she said, well, sure. And she thought I wanted to go into the Sunday school classes with the other little children who were carrying out their colored papers at the end of church, and they were all dressed up in their Sunday clothes. And so she took me down to J.C. Penney, bought me a little jacket and a tie and a white shirt, got me all dressed and saw me across the street. And she thought, well, I'd go right to the Sunday school. Well, I didn't. I went upstairs to that big room where the, all the moms and dads were sitting down. And I could see across the room and I could hear that music. And I could see it was a keyboard instrument like my piano, but it had two keyboards. So I walked all the way around till I found a chair right beside that man who was playing. And I thought, he's a real old guy. I bet he's almost 30. And he really could play well. And so I sat there and uh, the service began. And once in a while the moms and dads would stand up and the man would play the instrument. And they would sing. And then they would, he would play, and then they would pass a plate around, and moms and dads would put money in the, the plates. And then finally the man up at the front would talk, and then pretty soon the man playing the instrument would just play, and everybody got up and walked out. And I thought, how rude. He's still playing, and everybody's leaving the building. And so I still sat there till he was all through. And at that time... He turned and looked at me, and it was just he and I left in that big room. And he said, well, hello. He said, do you play the organ? And I said, no, but I'm taking piano lessons. And he said, would you like to play the organ? And I said, oh, I'd love to. And so he got down off the bench and propped me up on the bench, and I could see all those pedals down there. I could see it was a big keyboard probably larger so that you could play those pedals with your feet with your feet and so I was studying in my music lesson on my piano learning to play Silent Night and so I started to play Silent Night on the two keyboards and I looked down I could find the C pedal I put my foot on it and got my way all the way through Silent Night and when I finished he said I thought you told me you had never played the organ before and I said, I never have. This is the first time I ever have played the organ. And as it turned out, it was a Hammond organ. And so I thought that was the only organ in the world that you'd ever want to play. I loved that Hammond organ. And time passed, and I grew up a couple of years more. And I thought, I need to get a job so I'll have some spending money. I wonder if I could get a job in that music store around the corner. So I went to that music store, and they were the Hammond organ dealer, and they also carried Steinway pianos and music instruments and sheet music. And I went in looking for the man who I thought was the boss, and he said he was. And I said, I'd like to get a job working in your store. And he said, really, kid, what would you do if you worked here? And I said, well... I could dust the pianos and the organs, and I could sweep the floor, and I could wash the front window, and maybe I could help go on some of the deliveries. And he said, well, how much would we have to pay you? And I said, you wouldn't have to pay me anything. You would just let me go in that lesson room where you have an organ, and let me close the door, 
and let me practice on that organ because I don't have an organ at home to play on. And he said, kid, you're hired. And that was my first job. So time passed. One evening after dinner, I always practiced my piano lesson. And my father would sit reading his evening paper and um, listening to me. And this one evening he said, I'm going to run an errand. I'll be gone for about an hour, but you keep practicing and I'll be back. And so he left. And about an hour later he came back and he was carrying a large suitcase. And it looked heavy the way he was carrying it. And he set it down on the sofa and he opened it and it was an accordion. I thought, what? Another musical instrument with a keyboard. And he said, I thought you ought to have an instrument that's more portable than a piano to move around, and or an organ someday. And so he said, I not only got you the um, accordion, I have found you an accordion teacher, and you start on your first lesson this next Saturday. So next Saturday came, and he drove me to my lesson, and... It was easy, because except the keyboard was up on in instead of flat in front of me, and all those buttons, and he taught me how the buttons ran in a particular order that we call the circle of fifths, so I got that, and uh, the, the accordion was easy for me to learn to play. They had an accordion band with his other students too, and I got to be a member of that. And I remember one special evening my father had taken me to my accordion lesson and um, on the way home he liked to stop at his favorite bar and have one beer and talk to the owner of the bar, a, a guy named Buck Beltrami. And the bar was called the Farmer's Inn. And so in we went and little Tommy sat up on a bar stool and had a coke while dad and the guys on the bar uh, were having whatever they were drinking. And I heard my father say to Buck, yeah, I've just taken Tommy to his uh, accordion lesson. And Buck turned to me and he said, you take accordion? I said, yes, I do. He said, you have accordion in the car? And my dad said, yep, it's out there. He said, go get the accordion, you play for us, okay? And so my dad got the accordion out of the car. They stood me up on a bar stool, strapped on the accordion, and my music lesson was a tune called Lady of Spain. So I began to plow through Lady of Spain. And as I'm playing, I'm looking down the bar, and there's this little guy sitting way down at the end of the bar, and he reached forward, and he picked up the ashtray that was full of dirty ashes, and he turned it upside down on the bar. And as I played, I thought, how rude. Why would he do that? It's a mess now. And then he reached in his pocket, and he got a whole pocket full of change and he clinked it into the ashtray and then he moved it to his left and nudged the guy next to him and that guy reached in his pocket and he got a bunch of change and dropped it in and he moved it and by the time it got to me it was a little pile of wonderful change and when I finished all the guys at the bar applauded and they said that's a you pay for play and I thought I have found my calling if I can just play a song on an instrument like this and earn money, that's what I want to do. Well, the, the career got to be far more than that. I did play the organ in um, a cafe in Modesto just on Sunday, just after church for about an hour or two. And then we moved to, uh, to Sacramento and I got a job with the Sherman Clay uh, music company and uh, when I went in and said I, I got a job I'm a college student I need to pay for my college and so forth and the manager of the store said well what, what do you do and I said do you have a chord organ and the chord organ was a little sawed off version of a Hammond organ with a short keyboard and a button box that was put together just like an accordion and I said, let me show you what I can do on uh, the new chord organ that Hammond has just released. And they plugged it in, and I played several things on that little chord organ. And the, the, the manager said, you're hired, kid. We, we're going to start playing that at the state fair next week, and we're going to put you in our display. And all you have to do is just sit there and play it for the people who walk by. 
Well, time passed, and I got a job in a uh, dining room where they installed a theater pipe organ, a Robert Morton uh, four-manual, 13-rank uh, pipe organ. And they hired three of us organists in town to play that so that it could be played at lunch, at dinner, and the cocktail hour, and late at night. And I was one of those three organists who got hired. And that was a place called the Carl Greer Inn, Sacramento. And I played there for five years. And one evening, three men came in and sat at my organ bar, and they were dressed in suits, so I knew that they weren't the usual farm boys from local. And so they just sat quietly and sipped their adult drinks while I played various tunes. And I played show tunes and uh, musical overtures and things that are not usually played in a club. And so when I came to a break, I walked over to introduce myself to those men. And they said they were from the Hammond Organ Company. And they had heard about me and they just dropped in to have a drink and just hear me play. And, you know, thanks for the good music and so forth. Well... The evening ended and time passed and within two or three days I got a phone call from a man at the Hammond Organ Company in Chicago and they said our guys have heard you play and we would like to invite you to become one of our international concert artists and I said really what what does that mean and they said well can you meet with us uh, on Monday in San Francisco at a hotel and I said I can and I would talked to my wife about it. Sounds like it would be a travel job. So we, um, we went to San Francisco. I sat in the meeting and they said, we are putting together an artist package and selling you to every dealer in America, in Australia, in England, in Scotland, Wales, Europe, Canada, Alaska, Hawaii, and so forth. And we want to test you out. We're going to give you a sample group of concerts. And if, if the audience is like you, and if, if the dealers like you, then we'll keep you on as long as you care to be our artist. So I said, well, let me ask my wife how she feels about that. And by the way, how many is this sample concerts I have to play to, I guess, audition? And I thought it's probably, you know, three or four, maybe six. And they said, it's 84 concerts. And I said, 84 concerts is a test. How many concerts would I play in a year? And they said, probably around 200. So it would be a really a full-time job. So I said, well, let me check at home. And I talked with my wife and I said, I'd be gone a lot, but it sure would be a nice opportunity. And she said, you need to do what makes you happy and what will support our family. So I accepted the job and for the next eight years, I toured the world for the Hammond Organ Company doing Hammond sit-down concerts in some of the nicest big auditoriums of the world and some small town little gymnasiums and it was such fun. And there are so many stories to tell it that it would take us another half hour to get through all of that. So we'll save that for another time. But that seems to be sort of the story of my life, but it didn't end there. Um, after eight years of playing concerts, um, the president of the company at Hammond called a meeting of artists, uh, the players, and of all the representatives who sold Hammond's to dealers to be in a meeting in Chicago on December the 22nd. And when they called me, I said, gee, that's awfully close to Christmas. Do you really want to do that? And they said, yeah, we want to have a meeting and get ready for next year. And so I flew back and was a part of that meeting. And when it was over on, uh, I think it was December 23rd, um, I went out to O'Hare and uh, got ready for my flight and two planes came in to land and they crashed into each other. They're burning, the ambulances are coming, the airport is shut down, it's snowing, it's icy. It was an ugly mess. And by that time I had a million miles with United and I had access to those special secret lounges where you sit in an easy chair 
and they bring you all the cokes you want, and they bring you a sandwich if you want. So I was sitting there looking out at the flashing red lights and thinking, if I ever get home for Christmas to be with my family, my little children, I don't think I want to do this travel anymore. So, as it worked out, uh, a stewardess came in and tapped me on the arm and said, Mr. Thompson, we have one flight that's going to get out to go to San Francisco out on the runway now. If you go down to a particular gate, they'll put you on that flight. So I went scooting down, got on the flight. I did get home for Christmas and told my wife, I think I don't want to do that anymore. I miss you. I miss the children. I miss the refrigerator at midnight, you know, when I raid that. And so uh, the 1st of January or the 2nd, I called the president of the company and I said, I, I need to be out of that program. I can't do it anymore. He said, well, you've got several more concerts to play. Will you fulfill your contract? I said, indeed. You know, that's my nature. I will play the ones I'm now uh, contracted to do. And when that's done, I'm done. He said, well, we don't want to lose you from the company. You've met all the dealers. You've been all over the world. You know the instrument intimately. He said, um, uh, next Monday, I want you to come fly back to Chicago and sit with me and we'll talk. So I did. And I said, what, what do you got in mind? He said, well, what I have in mind would cause you to have to move you and your family to Illinois. And we want you to become a part of the executive team at the Hammond Organ Company. And so I said, um, what position would you put me? And he said, well, we're not real pleased with the way sales are going. We want to make you uh, the national sales manager. And so I said, well, that, that sounds like a, a busy job, but once again, I'm going to talk with my wife about pulling up roots that are deep in California and moving us all to Illinois where it snows. And so we, um, I went back and we talked and I asked what the job paid and it was very nice. And so I talked to my wife and we said, okay, let's do it. It'll be a lark to live where it snows. So I picked up my family, sold our property here in California, and we moved to Illinois. And I became the national sales manager of the Hammond Organ Company. And then the following year, they moved me up to become the vice president of marketing of the company. and. That, that was such a huge amount of work. It was just more than I had uh, wanted to, uh, to do. So after spending some many, many months in that job, I said, I think it's time for me to retire from music and move back to California. So we did that. And I moved my family to the little town of Carmel, California. and. I immediately got hired as church organist in a little church right in the center of Carmel. So I had a great little pipe organ to play, and they had their own private parking lot, so I never had to fight for a parking place in the village. And my wife was a fine art painter, was immediately picked up by one of the nicer galleries in Carmel. And so she painted, I played my music, and life was wonderful. Well. Life was really wonderful, except that our family, our parents were growing old, and we felt the need to be back at real work. And uh, my wife said, well, what would you like to do next? And I said, well, when I was playing concerts with him, and one of the fun parts was being on television shows, on the noon shows in big cities, and promoting the concerts. I liked the world of television. and so. When we uh, moved back to Carmichael, I immediately got involved in the television industry and I spent the next 20 years with mostly working in and out of PBS affiliate. And I produced a television series for 20 years. That means I produced over a thousand episodes of that series. I produced documentaries, infomercials, commercials, and so forth. And so that was my second career. The first career of the music, it was completed. My second career was now blossoming, and that's where I am today. 
So there's the story of my life and the life of my connection with the NCA. I continue to be a member. Uh, I stay away from boards and uh, that kind of thing. You know, I've been the board uh, member for the Sacramento Ballet and for NCA and for the Sacramento Youth Symphony. Made great friends, but now, you know, as I press into my 90s, it's time to take some time for Tom. So I enjoy my days sitting at my easel painting and looking out at the garden and spend time with my grandchildren. And that's the story of my life. Thank you for being so patient to listen to me. Goodbye for now.